Uh, it's a little bit better. <clears throat> Still a little bit dark, but better than it was before. <clears throat> Still playing with some of the lighting effects that I have to deal with here in my house. <clears throat> well, in case you're wondering, that disc on the left is, is not the moon. I'm not a moon worshipper. <laughs> that, that's a, a boron. That's a Celtic drum. Always wanted one. Well, maybe one day. Um, finally get around to learning. But that's not the subject of today. Today's video is the set, start of a series on church history. There's so many morons running around claiming to have Because the crazies will rule this world eventually, and that's when everything goes to pot. Speaking of pot, I think Dan is about to go to pot. We legalize it. But anyway, <laughs> that's, that's a different subject. I keep going off. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> anyway, when you look at, at our history, of course we know the story of, of, of Yeshua, the one people call Jesus. And of course, you got the debate: Do we call him Yeshua or should we call him Jesus? Does it make any difference? You got the yes camp and no camp, and maybe camp. And I don't know camp. And really, what's this schmazzle about? Some people argue about anything and everything. And realistically, the Bible tells us not to be involved with foolish and vain arguments. Don't go anywhere. They're right, absolutely right. I'm going to teach you one of my famous teachings. All right, this is the most sought out quote of the day. I've taught it to several students who now use it and find such freedom. It's called In Your World. And why do we say that? One, <clears throat> it is a polite way of getting out of an argument. And it acknowledges the fact that this is a society and country and nation where you can believe anything you want to believe. We have a thing called the freedom of religion, although that is getting less and less. It's freedom of religion for any other religion except Christianity seems to be free to say what they want. Muslims are allowed to criticize Christianity, but Christianity could not possibly dare criticize Islam because, you know, well, we're just Islamophobic. Uh, bucko, I don't care. Call me an Islamic phobic. The gay people want to call me gay phobic or heterosexual phobic or some kind of phobic. I'm not a phobic. I'm not afraid of anything, all right? But anyway, that's beside the point. You can use all the words to try to control me, and I could use words to control you, but I'm not into control, I'm not into power, I'm into an authority, and I stand in an authority commissioned to me by Yeshua HaMashiach, uh, by the sealing and assignment of the Ruach HaKadosh of the Holy Spirit. Now, after he kind of like beamed up Scotty, and went to be with his father. Certain precedents took place. They were afraid and they scattered a bit. But they finally got called to unification. And they pulled everybody together and had a review. This has been known as the Upper Room Experience. That was the first council where they came together. And they met. And the, quote, movement of what's become Christianity or Messianicism was born. Let us set some things perfectly straight. In Acts it records they were first called Christian at Antioch. And we take that going like, oh, there you go. That's when we first became Christians. We're all Christians. Listen, buddy. 
it was never a term of uh, uh, gratitude, all right? It was a term, it was an insult to be called a Christian. Not that it's a shame to be called a Christian, but in the pagan world, you, you, you were something else, totally, absolutely way out there. And the pagan world still feels, after 2,000 years, you're still way out there and won't accept this. In fact, our master told us we wouldn't be acceptable. They were Jewish predominantly in, in their order, and they were Jewish predominantly in their leadership. But many Gentile, Goyim, had flown into the, into the folds. We had a meeting about this, and what are we going to do with these Gentile people? That question was also addressed back at the time of the Exodus, where they crossed over. And they looked at Moses and they said, What about these ones? They're not us. They're not sons of Abraham. They're not the descendants of Israel. These are men from other nations. And they were always respectful just outside the camp. They never took position inside the Israeli camp. They stayed to the fringes. They helped out when they could and where they could. They became the first alarm if the, enemy, the camp became attacked. They also became the first victims if the enemy, if the, if the camp had been attacked by an enemy. That being said, they addressed that issue way back then. So I tell people, if your preacher is one of these idiots that like to go out there saying that this New Testament was something that just, you know, the Old Testament didn't work and the Jews didn't work, so God had to come up with something new. So you came up with the new Messiah, a new group of leadership, which later became Christian, and therefore, you know, the old system has been done away with. They forget the words of our Messiah who said, not one jot or tittle should ever pass. Nothing's going to change until all of the work in the Torah is fulfilled. Wait a minute. They're telling you that the law is fulfilled. That everything needs to be done. Yet Jesus himself said, not until the very end. So that means, there's, regardless where you look at it, there has to be still things that are applicable. Now some of the laws we do not need today. Now, before everybody gets all in a big tither about that, better look it up and find out what exactly I'm talking about. The law that is being referred to is the law of the priesthood. There is no temple, for at the moment, there is no need for the sacrifice and no need for the priesthood. This, my friend, is the doctrine of grace. A simple confession and changing of ways and a modification of lifestyle was all that was required to be a follower of the Messiah. Today we have all kinds of things. Come to my altar. Let us pray you through. We'll lay hands on you and declare to you that your sins are forgiven. Yet those same guys that do that have a habit of saying, but nobody ever gave the Pope any authority to forgive sins. Actually, in the scripture, only one has the authority to forgive sins. All sin requires sacrifice. All sin requires atonement. Every mistake that we make, saying I'm sorry, is not good enough. There's a price to be paid. And the ultimate price is throwing ourselves upon the altar. Because we have nothing else left to give. As we explore the depth of our history, let us look at the progresses and changes in doctrine. We are to be preachers of the good news, carriers of the good news. The fact that I'm a sinner is not news. All men have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We are all sinners, 100% of us, 7.58 billion people on this planet, not one is righteous, no, not one. So it's time to wake up and smell the coffee and accept who you are. There by the grace of God, Paul said, goes I. I'm just as bad as any one of you out there 
and you're just as bad as me. There's none that is more righteous than the other one. So if you see me doing something in the spiritual realm, then maybe you should question yourself if you're not doing it. What changes do you need to make? What is the prayers that you need to offer up? As we explore through church history, point by point, era by era, doctrine by doctrine, we're going to be able to learn, see, and review what it is that made the Nazarene the Nazarene, while the rest of the world went off in a different direction, including the church world. This is Dan Bomey saying Shalom, may the peace of God be with you and your household, both now and until the end of time. Amen.